win, number 900. This is SportsCenter. We all saw championship, part of championship week presented by 7-Up. Dave Barnett with Tim McCormick and Jason Williams. We have 15-47 in the opening half and a 5-4 lead for St. Joseph's. The number 5 seed against the number 10 seed, Xavier, which gets a slam inside from Justin Page. And that's the mismatch that you're looking at. St. Joe's lacking in the athleticism department. Xavier is loaded. Five guys all able to get to the rim. A crazy A-10 tournament in which the top four seeds all lost on day one. In the quarterfinals here on Thursday, Rob Ferguson has the jumper go in and out. The marquee game was the upset by Temple of top seed Regular season undefeated in the A-10, George Washington Temple knocked off in the semis yesterday by St. Joe's. Josh Duncan helped Xavier eliminate Fordham. And I have to say, guys, Tim McCormick called it. He said they would go out early in the tournament. He was right about GW. Uh, I just think that losing pops, you can get by for a short period of time, but long term, you're going to miss his talent too much. And guys, this is a shocking matchup right here. If you had told me a month ago they'd be in the championship, I would call you a liar. Chet Stakaitis, a big reason St. Joe's is here. In an eight-game win streak for the Hawks, he's been hitting almost half his three-pointers. Senior from <laughs> Beach, Florida. And like Xavier getting it inside, eight to five. I like that. Well, I think one of the reasons Rowe hits that shot, he's been doing a great job of tracking Stachitis wherever he goes, really staying on his right hook, trailing him every possession, not giving him easy shots. St. Joe's was 10 and 12. Eight straight wins. Xavier has lost two senior starters in the last month. Their best player, Brian Thornton, to an ankle injury, and senior guard Diedrich Finn, who had started 53 games in a row, dismissed in late February for violating team rules. To kind of short rebound, Justin Dolman. Hey, Tim, that's St. Joseph's problem. You see Brian Thornton right there winning on the side, but they have nobody who can create shots for them, and you have Stakaitis trying to do stuff like that. Cage measures the three. Doesn't shoot many, but he makes a good percentage. Nine for 21 for the year, 11-5 on this so-called neutral home floor, about 15 minutes or so from the Xavier campus. Doesn't feel too neutral, guys. Stachitis. That's good. Rainmaker, that's good. <laughs> yeah, and that's the um, sit down and shut up, please, basket <laughs> right there. Now, here's the defensive dilemma for the Hawks. Who do you focus on when you cover Xavier? Because all five guys are dangerous weapons. Including Dolman, who can hit three. Well, Tim, you're exactly right. You get a penetration of Cage and Burrell down there, but at the same time, you have Duncan and Dolman, who can hit three point shots. Dolman, 6'9", junior, with his 41st three of the year. A 10-3 run by the Musketeers. Who said there wasn't going to be an atmosphere in here? Who said that? Pat Kalafis, 6'10", guard off the bench. His three-pointer no good. St. Joe's yesterday on 20 field goals had 19 assists. I have never heard of that high uh, percentage. And 13 of the 20 were threes. Yeah, <laughs> Phil Martelli said it reminded him of the Jameer Nelson days. They start this game 3 for 12. Xavier, 6 out of their first 10. Duncan from Dolman, foul. 12-12 in the first half from Cincinnati. 14-7, Duncan of the Musketeers off to the hot start. ESPN's exclusive presentation of Championship Week is presented by 7-Up. If you want 100% natural lemon and lime flavors, the only way to go is up. And in part by Wheat Thins, zero grams of trans fat. Wheat Thins, taste good, feel good. Xavier starts hot. They've made four of their last five, including a, a couple of threes. And lead St. Joe's 14 to 7. We just had our first foul almost eight minutes in, charged to Rob Ferguson, Josh Duncan, the 6'9 sophomore from here in Cincinnati, Moeller High School, two years ago, the Ohio State Player of the Year. You know, Tim, I have a question for you. What's the difference right now between 
Xavier to win playing St. Joseph's compared to when we saw them a week ago playing St. Joseph's at Xavier. Well, Jay, well, I, I think the big key, Sean Miller, their coach after the UMass loss, brought his team on the plane prior to going home and asked everybody else to leave. And he said, guys, sometimes we focus so much on big picture items that are upon the offense, on the scout report. We need to upgrade our defensive effort. We've got to work harder. That's been the biggest difference that I've seen. Well, I think you're exactly right. St. Joseph's shooting 25% from the field. And the shots have been long in coming in this half-court offense. 12-2 run against the Hawks by the Musketeers over the last four minutes. And again, the shot clock at 10 before they even get the, a halfway decent look at a shot. Down to five, Kalifas. Down to three, it does not see the shot clock, which expires before Jello got the desperation heave up. What happened to the clock in the back of your head? It failed Pat Kalifas, 11.35 of the first. Xavier by nine. Xavier up nine. Winners of this tournament 2002, again in 2004. Last year, 17 and 12, but their first time in nine years with no postseason. And this has been a problem for SJU the entire year. Look at the way, deep, look at the defense that Xavier's playing right now. Everybody has their eye on the ball, great help defense. And, and St. Joseph have no aware of the shot clock, but you got to know in time and situation, you got to get a shot off. And I would love to see St. Joseph's drive to the basket for an easy shot. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Phil Martelli knows the same thing. It's a major problem. The Hawks rely heavily on threes. Last night in the semis, they made 39 points versus Temple. Remember, this is the fourth game in four days. When your legs are tired, you can't rely on the perimeter. And being a guy from Duke who shot a lot of threes, I know about that. You got to go to the basket. You got to get something easy to get your motivation, your spirit going. Well, you, you played three games in three days. How did you have a different approach in the ACC tournament? Well, well the way we were taught, we always tried to get something going to the basket. You see the strong move right there right now. But you always try to get something going to the basket, make life a little easier, and that eventually opens up three-point shot opportunities. Brandon Cole, 6'8 junior, just in off the bench. 18-7. Traveling. Back-to-back -back turnovers. The offensive flaws are crystal clear for St. Joe's. They lack playmakers, not much penetration or post scoring. And Phil Martelli, he'll try to get creative by setting some picks and, and, and getting some motion, but it's just really difficult versus this Musketeer defense. Well, what you see right here is a huge matchup. You see Leo and Burrell. Lee held Burrell to 2 of 11 shooting last time these two met. Burrell's had the upper hand today so far. Jallo out on Burrell. Can't shake him with a spin move. This is B.J. Raymond, a 6'6 freshman from Toledo, who was fouled out there by Abdullah Jallo. Team second. And after brief rest, Duncan and Wolf return. Dolman and Burrell get their first rest. Emotions are so high right now. These kids playing for a bit to the NCAA tournament. Everybody's fighting every single possession. Depth, big advantage for Xavier, even though they are without those two senior starters. St. Joe's is without a really promising freshman backup center, Ahmad Nivens, who turned an ankle day one against St. Louis. Didn't play last night or tonight. And Nivens was part of a seven-man rotation. Plus for St. Louis, he had five block shots and one put-back dunk. Stakaitis is missed out of bounds to the Musketeers. Ahmad Nivens from Jersey City is getting 23 minutes a game. And uh, really productive. More than six points, five boards, good shot blocker. Tim, who would have thought that Xavier would have been here without Brian Ford? No, and I, I can't remember a team transforming the way they play more than Xavier. Jallo with a force rebound Cole. Xavier's looking to up the tempo. Justin Cage with seven. And it's 20 to seven timeout St. Joseph. Good game. I tell you, telling his team to calm down a little bit. 
You see AJ forcing up a couple of shots in transition. Last time these two teams played, he played very calm. You see he's bad shots left, and that's been a problem for him, I think, throughout his entire year this year. His shots, and you see the strong finish right here by Cage. Yeah. I look at Justin Cage. He's a pit bull in sneakers. I think he's always the toughest guy out there. I've become a big fan. Dave, he's my favorite musketeer since D'Artagnan. <laughs> <laughs> well, Xavier over UMass, Charlotte, the number two seed, and Fordham. So the three-game win streak following losses in eight of the last 13 games in the regular season as they had to redo the offense. Without Brian Thornton, fifth-year senior, 15 points, seven rebounds per game, best shooter percentage-wise in history of the program. The biggest change is the biggest possible change. They go from an inside-out team to an outside-in team. Yeah, but let's look on the bright side for Xavier. They said that by not having a post guy in the lane, it's opened things up. Now that really has allowed their penetrators to get to the rim anytime they want. Definitely, guys, in Cage, Duncan, and Doman all combined for 45 points and 17 rebounds in their last game in the 18th one. Wow. First foul of the game on the Musketeers. For about 10 and a half minutes. Frank Scagliata, Joe DeMeo, Ray Perrion, letting them play. Pharrell tight on Stachitis. Ferguson, who's been steaming hot in the eight-game winning streak, 54% from three, 13 out of 24, and that ends a 9-0 run by Xavier. Dave, I don't know what they're telling Fergie. Dave, you're seen over 50% from the field. I would tell you to shoot it every time. Well, actually, Phil Martelli was showing his team some game tape from early in this year prior to the Temple matchup, and it was at that moment that it really surprised him how far Ferguson's game has come from a confidence standpoint. They've been on him uh, all two seasons really to shoot more because he's 52 percent and hits those threes as he just showed Cole looks for the call doesn't get it Gallo tries to be a one-man fast break and carries it see in that situation right there you got to know as a guard you got to pull the ball out it's a one of three situation the odds are not in your favor get your team in a set now earlier this year Abdullah Jallo told me he used to steal tape from the Hawks video library to look at the play of Delonte West and Jameer Nelson. That's a situation right there where the All-American guards would have pulled it out and run the offense. They need a bucket in a big way. I think that was a bad decision. Definitely, Tim. I think, you know, for AJ, he is one of the hardest workers I ever met. Got a chance to talk to him a lot. All he wants to get, wants to get better, but he has to take his time and just be poised out there on the court. Yeah, by the way, he did return all the tapes to the St. Joe's <laughs> video library. <laughs> Last turnover earns him a seat next to Phil Martelli. Pat Kalafis returns. Woo. And the whistle prior to the shot. Offensive foul. They're going to look at Duncan inside his first. St. Joe's the number five seed, which came in here with a five-game winning streak and extended it by beating Dayton, St. Louis, and uh, easily handling Temple yesterday in the semifinals. Yeah, in mid-January, Phil Martelli was grumpy and he was sour when we had his game at Hawk Hill. He said it all changed at Temple on February 14th. After a blowout loss, he called his players together, and the seniors changed the way that they were playing. Stachitis continues to provide the only steady offense for them. He's got seven of their 12. Well, obviously, St. Joseph's is feeling great. The last time they were in an eight-game winning streak was that 2003-2014. That went 27-0. And then promptly lost in the A-10 tournament. George Washington can relate. Timeout, 7.50 the first half. A 20-12 lead for Xavier. Playing about 15 minutes from their campus here in Cincinnati. Well, the A-10 championship has been a bracketologist's nightmare so far. It's the first time none of the top seeds even reached the semifinals. George Washington following on the day one to Temple. Xavier as the number 10 seed, lowest ever to reach the championship game. And St. Joe's looking to win its first title since 97, third overall. And the surprising thing there is they, until this season, had won the last five A-10 regular season championships. And two years ago, were two points away from the final four. Even that that team didn't win the A-10 tournament. 
as Stanley Burrell has it tipped up almost in by Page and saved by Stakaitis, who gets the timeout call. Uh, to follow on your point, Dave, I think it's interesting that Phil Martelli decided after their struggles the last couple of years in the A-10 tournament that he would not have any shoot-arounds during the tournament. Rather than come here and shoot, they stayed in the hotel to rest their legs. Save, you're up 20 to 12. Here's how they put together this eight-point lead. Well, you look at the move right there by John Sutton. It's so fluid, so nice, so easy. I mean, they've been doing very well inside. Their last game versus Fordham, they shot 60% from inside the paint. And they've been doing an absolutely amazing job today, too. Dolmer right there with a three. But that's what we were talking about, guys. You know, we, we think this is a loss of Brian Thor, and they haven't been going inside. But Duncan and Dolman have been doing an even better job going inside for them continuously. Little opening right here for the Hawks. Xavier, which hit seven of its first 12, now one for its last seven. They've been scoreless about two and a half minutes. And the last uh, five points belong to the Hawks. Ferguson is stripped by Dolman, and the loose ball will go out of bounds. Looks like off of Stachitis. Gotta love the hustle, baby. It's tournament time. You can feel it. Uh, there's no secrets in March. You're, you're not going to have any gimmicks or trick plays. It's all about who can operate the best, the most efficient with tired legs. You can see it right there. Their heads are fresh. Their minds are really getting after it, but their legs and their bodies aren't responding. Let me tell you guys, we were playing Maryland ACC tournament. I dove in to get a ball, and I started bleeding. You see right there, the field goals. Xavier shooting the ball very well. Was bleeding, came over to the sideline. Coach K said, who cares if you're bleeding? It's March. Let's go get it. <laughs> Duncan rejected by Dave Mellon. And uh, the drought continues now for the Musketeers. Hey, Dave, you know the number, right, that Phil Martelli always wants to get to with his team if he has a chance to win? 65 points. It's not working. Five of 16 start is the reason, 31%. Kalafis has uh, hit a couple off the bench. 6'10 guard, a sophomore from Castleberry, Florida. And it's 7-0 run now by St. Joe's as they try to claw their way back in the game. You know, it's a little upgrade on the defensive end for St. Joe's the last couple trips. Burrell with a quickness mismatch as he goes inside on Ferguson. Offensive foul. Well, I just feel like they didn't take advantage of the post-up opportunity down low. They had Stachitis on Doman, and Burrell kind of forced the issue right here, trying to be, do a little bit too much. By the way, he got to take his time, and I think that's been a problem for Burrell at times. He's going 105 miles an hour. He really needs to slow up. Uh, as you look at the defensive numbers, St. Joe's knows that their key today is perimeter defense. They can't allow the blow by. I think Stanley Burrell is a dangerous player, but sometimes making the transformation to point guard has been difficult for him. As we hit the six-minute mark, what was a 13-point lead down to six. Biggest possession of the game as a result for St. Joe's here. Again, the shot clock becomes an issue. Down to eight. As Kalafis moves in and tips in his own miss. I mean, Dave, you called it. It's been nothing but delicious chaos here so far, baby. Uh, what was that? <laughs> De delicious say what? anymore. It's only Dave's line. Only Dave can say it. <laughs> Well, you covered it. Timeout, Sean Miller. From day one, this has been delicious chaos. The top four <laughs> seeds out, you kidding? And a 9-0 run by the Hawks. They're back in this A-10 final. Well, it may only sound like this is 100% Xavier Crowd. There's a small pocket of uh, Hawks faithful over there. Behind the St. Joe's bench. Otherwise, it's really uh, even more of a home court advantage in, in one way than it would be if this game were at the Cintas Center on the Xavier campus because uh, there's 60% more seats here at the West Bank Arena.
It reminds me a lot about playing in Greensboro when we were playing the ACC tournament. It really wasn't fair for a lot of the teams considering it was pretty much home advantage for us. Uh, let me ask you a question. A regular game in Cameron or somewhere on the road, what is more intensity? Playing for an ACC championship in Greensboro or to play in your home building or a regular ACC game? Well, I think obviously playing for the championship, you, you put you know, all the suicides, all the times to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to practice. I mean, this is what all culminates to right here, trying to win a chip, get into the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the passion of the, the home crowd has to change things a little bit. It does to a certain extent, but this is a tournament. This is the time you live for. B.J. Raymond with another Xavier offensive foul, again drawn by Mallet. His second. And ESPN's coverage of championship week continues tomorrow afternoon. Boston College was just knocked off. North Carolina will face top seed Duke at the ACC championship. Syracuse Pitt in the Big East championship tonight at 8 Eastern. There's your matchup. GMAC against Carl Krauser. Dave, who do you take, Dave? Who do you take in that matchup, Syracuse or Pitt? I can't go against Syracuse at this point. And I can now tell you that some magic dust to settle on them the last three days. Hotter than a spicy burrito, I'm telling you. The kid's good. Stakaitis into a double team back out, and Ferguson. Again, tipped in by Kalafis. Eight points off the bench to make it a two point Xavier lead. I love Kalafis. He does everything. He can bring the ball up, he can rebound, he does whatever his team needs him to do in order to win the basketball game. Xavier won for its last eight. They have not scored since the 9.48 mark. And they turned it over again on the carry. Yeah, things may have been a little too easy for Sean Miller's team. And a lot of defensive effort by St. Joe's. That has been the biggest difference. Scoring a couple points off of turnovers, gaining confidence. Stakaitis could have tied it up. An 11-0 Hawks run. More than five and a half minutes now since the last Musketeers points. Another turnover, their sixth four on two break. Kalafis ahead for Ferguson to Ooh. tie it up. How about the little scoop shot right there, baby? The little scoop. Scooping you. <laughs> and another timeout. It was 20 to 7, Xavier. They haven't scored since 9.48 was on the clock. It's 13 unanswered points for St. Joe. Yeah, major upgrade in the offensive end. Ferguson from deep. He has improved. They're getting points in transition between 15 and 20 per game. Phil Martelli said that the biggest difference between now and earlier in the season was the fact that his team had trouble scoring. They were offensive challenged. And what they've been able to do is by pushing transition, they've gained some confidence and now they're getting a better chance to get up to that 65, which is the Hawks' magic number. I well, you know I think this has to be one of Phil Martelli's best coaching years for all the struggles his team is going through early and for them to show signs of this passion late in the season only says about how great of a coach Phil Martelli is. I look at Phil Martelli as sort of a mad scientist on the offensive end of the court. He's always tinkering and changing things. Over the course of the summer, he sits down with his staff and completely reworks his offense. The defense has worked as well because Xavier has been very careless, a little bit loose with the ball in their last six trips. So if you go to St. Joe's, you can't say, well, this is our system. This is what we do. Because that <laughs> could change game to game, week to week, definitely season to season. <laughs> Dave, this afternoon I was looking over some game notes from last year, and I was reading about what St. Joe's does offensively. It's not even the same offense as it is right now. You might as well throw all those notes out, all the old game tape, because their approach right now is completely different. It's kind of like what they used to say about Don Shula. He could take his in and beat urine, or he could take urine and beat his in. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't imagine that we're not watching the Charlotte versus George W. right now. I mean, that's the game we've been talking about all year, but this is what happens. This is a tournament. Anything happens. Turnovers five of the last six possessions for the Musketeers. Six scoreless minutes. And here's that matchup. Duncan tries to take charge. And did he charge? Or did he draw the foul? 
called on St. Joe's. Timeout 345 in the first half of the tie game. For English, say yes. Well, the former head coach of the Musketeers celebrates. And the current head coach has some different emotions right now. Sean Miller has seen a 13-0 run by the Hawks. Offensive rebound. Wolf off the miss by Dolman. 13-0. Six and a half scoreless minutes. Finally ending on the three by Justin Cage. His second of the night, just his tenth of the year. Former Indiana Mr. Basketball, first ever to sign with Xavier after winning that award. Really love the fight and passion in Xavier's eyes are now really trying to buckle down defensively. St. Joseph's been doing a great job being patient with the basketball. Really remind me a lot of Hoosier basketball in Indiana. Stakaitis as Burrell lost his footing and Stakaitis loses his. Meanwhile, the shot the Musketeers have been waiting for since midway in this half. Love the flow of the shot. Just took his time. Kind of got his feet set and just knocked it down like he did as it before. Uh, if you're trying to figure out what the difference is from St. Joe's, let me tell you right now, it's their patient. I look at Xavier as a hot flame type of defense. They, they're really aggressive. They play some Rottweiler defense for about the first 10 or 15 seconds, then they fade. St. Joe's is getting any shot they want if they're patient. Well, an official's review going on over there. Sure, it has to do with whether there are three free throws coming or two. Poor decision defensively, don't you think? Definitely. Guys, this might be a little bit off the subject, but how about OSU getting into the conference championship? A lot of surprises this year. The, the bracketologists, the bubble masters have a major challenge in store for them. That uh, definitely looked like a three going up. I think so. Stanley Burrell called for his second foul. And uh, Prince Scagliato makes the appropriate call against Akitas' feet. Uh, slightly blocked out there by Burrell. The other angle showed they were behind the three-point line. 82% free throw shooter for the best free throw shooting team in the nation. St. Joe's, 79%. This will be their first free throw of this game. And that right there shows you the veteranship of Stachitis. Barely got grazed on the arm, but fell down a little, a little veteran move that I know Tim has done plenty of times, saying myself. No, I, I, I'm the one knocking people down. <laughs> This Stachitis has, has really shown a lot more lift and aggressiveness in this tournament. It's reminding me a lot of Pat Carroll when he was knocking down jump shots for the Hawk. First two of the three free throws are in. Stachitis tonight playing in a St. Joe's record 128th appearance of his career. And he hits all three. So for some guys just love to watch and shoot the ball, the way their elbows formed and the way the ball comes up their fingertips. He's definitely one of those guys that you get amazed by the way he can stroke it. Cage, who leads Xavier with 10. Stakaitis now 10 to lead the Hawks. Wolf fouled by Lee, who almost stripped him. First on Dwayne Lee, team's fifth. Yeah. Something I want to share with you about St. Joe's defense. It looks like they're in a philosophy called makes and misses. If they score, they fall back into their switching matchup zone. On a missed shot, they come back and play man-to-man -man defense. It's probably the most zone that I've ever seen from a Phil Martelli coach team. He, he loves man-to-man -man defense. Tim, also, they're switching everything. On every screen and roll, they're switching everything. Don't look for him to change. They have a 16 to 3 run going. Dolman travels. Turnover number seven by the Musketeers. I, I'm curious because remember, Diedrich Finn is out. He was kicked off the team. He was a senior point guard. Now they're going with Johnny Wolf. He's a freshman. In these situations, Jason, what is a point guard's job? What is it that Wolf is not doing? Well, you just got to run your team. You got to get them in the right sets at the right time. And for a freshman point guard, that's hard to do. You've never been in this environment before, these situations, 8 and 10. 
Knocked away from Calathis, rolls right back to him, now loose on the floor. Oh, yeah. And the hell ball will give it back to the Musketeers. Now, ball security, a, a big area of growth for the freshman Wolf and Raymond. The minutes are big, but you know what's significant about this? If Finn and Thornton are still on the team, in this game, these two players probably don't even play. Now look at the minutes that they're playing. They're featured on this team. You know, Tim, I think that could be the best thing for Xavier, because you talk about when they come back next year, these guys are going to have the experience, maybe a little bit more better than I can. You know, still, they're, they're playing like freshmen. They haven't got a chance to play the entire year. So now, you know, usually when you see freshmen playing at the beginning of the year, they play like veterans at the end, but they're kind of playing like freshmen right now. They're still maturing. I'm going to tell you right now, Xavier is favored next year to win the Atlantic 10 tournament and the regular season because they're going to add Drew Lavender. This foul called on a push by Dave Mallon, his first and the team sixth. Hey, Dave, don't you think UMass might have something to say about that for next UMass year? UMass has got major transfer Woo! help coming in. Yep. Gary Forbes and my man Chris Lowe. Don't forget, though, Drew Lavender played in the Big 12, McDonald's All-American. Dolman wheeling around Kalafis, misses the reverse, and Mallon clears it with a minute 50 and a half. And St. Joe's, which trailed 20 to 7, will shoot for the lead. What about Charlotte? What about St. Louis? Ferguson held off by Dolman. Kalafis back for Ferguson with a whistle inside. Oh, the defensive awareness of Dolman to take the charge. Give him up the body. Get him square in the chest. That's the kind of defensive intensity you need to win these kind of games in the A-10 tournament. Uh, who do you think is the best player for Xavier, the most valuable player? Because you can make an argument for Dolman, Duncan, and Cage. Who do you think? I go Duncan. <laughs> By far the most talented. Yeah, I think he showed it yesterday. Career high 20. I think Duncan, when they give him the ball, had it. A little bit low. Couldn't hang on. Another hell ball. And this time the arrow has it back over to the Hawks with a minute 14 and a half. Xavier started red hot. They led 20 to 7. They've gone cold now. They're 39%. So is St. Joe's. Cage with 10. Stachitis with 10. Yeah. Let me remind you what a shocking thing this would be for either one of these teams to win. Early in the year, injuries, suspensions, erratic play, both of these teams, there, there's no way that you could have predicted they'd be here today. Also, Tim, four games and four nights. I mean, this is a lot. This is this is like AAU basketball. <laughs> Ferguson over Dolman misses everything. Down to Duncan with 55 seconds. A-10 tournament guaranteed to produce a champion well, that will be the lowest seeded champion ever. In fact, St. Joe's, the five seed, would tie West Virginia in 84 if they win it. Xavier at the number 10 seed obviously would set the record. And Duncan with the three with 31 seconds breaks the tie. And this guy can get going. That's the only question for Xavier. Will they keep giving him the ball, keep utilizing his strength? You've got to like the senior point guard in this kind of a scenario. The 99% Xavier crowd on its feet. Seven seconds as Lee takes it into the teeth of the defense and gets fouled with five seconds and a half. And guys, how about Dwayne Lee? He's been the most veteran point guard for his team. He's been the glue for them the entire year. Last game, he had 14 points. Seven assists, two turnovers. Is he supposed to do that? Is he supposed to shoot the ball like that? Hey, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. If he continues, he's going to have a chance someday to play in the NBA. With his length, his strength, his skill level, and ability to put that on the floor. You've got you've to come up with a compelling argument to convince me otherwise, Dave. I won't even try. I'm right there with it. <laughs> well, B.J. Raymond called for his third foul. Inbounds pass. Kalief is rejected by Dolman, who came down with it out of bounds. 1.6 seconds in the half. Dolman, one of the top shot blockers in this conference. Sixth, 1.6 per game. Oh, athleticism. Gotta love it. Give me that. That block was cold-blooded, Dave. Cold-blooded. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
That's the guy not used to getting it handed back to him. 6'10", Calathus. They're going to review the clock here. Currently showing 1.6. So uh, while the officials do that, time for uh, both head coaches to get a little huddle going. Xavier up by three after going six minutes and 27 uh, seconds without a single point after they'd opened up the 20 to seven lead. Yeah, we talked a little bit about the point guard playing. Sean Miller was a tremendous point guard at Pitt, made second team on their all centennial team. And he talked to Johnny Wolf as I'm talking. Let's see if we can figure out what point the ball went out of bounds. But remember Sean Miller, he was a point guard on that Big East championship team. He was a freshman, and he played with Jerome Lane and Charles Smith. He pulled Wolf aside today and told him, look, you're surrounded by talent. Just share the job, and you will do fine out there. He's not quite surrounded by Charles Smith and Jerome Lane, though. <laughs> I mean, that's helpful advice to a point. Hey, guys, quick question for you. Do you think the Xavier team is as good if Brian Thornton is still playing? Do you think these freshmen have time to still mature oh, if Thornton's playing? Absolutely. If he's still playing, they're in this tournament regardless of this game. Yeah. It's not the case now. I mean, look at Brian Thornton, 15 and 7 per game, shoot 65% from the field. Four times this year, he was the player of the week. Let's take a look at the play, Dave. You make the call. Well, they stopped it at five seconds. And that was uh, before the block. Yeah, it was on the... Subsequently was the right. block by uh, Dolman on Calathus, which is uh, the one that's in question here. You know, Tim, we were speaking about Sean Miller before. I got a great story about him. Wayne, he actually was assistant coach for NC State. And uh, just talking about how much of a comparator he is. I was on the right wing, by right by the bench in Herb deck. I was going up to shoot a three. And the first one to yell, shot off, was Sean Miller yelling right in my face. All right, here we go. And the whistle blows at about two and a half seconds there. Did you ever ask him about yelling at you? No, he's just a comparator. That's what he does. He tries to make you miss shots and tries to win basketball games. Well, 1.6. They add a uh, uh, full second and a half, and it's 3.1 seconds now before halftime under this A-10 championship. Fifth seeded St. Joe's trailing Kent seed Xavier, which just broke even to the regular season. In the conference, 8-8, eight eight. they're 20 and 10, their ninth 20-win season of the last 10 years. Inbounds to Stachitis, leans Ooh. in and misses everything at the buzzer, but a terrific recovery by St. Joe's, no question. Early it looked like Duncan and the Musketeers would run them off the floor here in Cincinnati. They come from 13 back, Stachitis leading the way with 10. And in this unpredictable 8-10 championship, Xavier by three at the half. Welcome in. It is the 7-Up Halftime Report. Dave Revson alongside Doug Gottlieb. Two big issues as you come into championship week. The first is the one-bid leagues, and would the team that was assumed to be headed in from one of those one-bid leagues, a la George Washington in this conference, lose and open the door for another team? We've seen that happen here in the A-10. The other one, Doug, bid stealers. Multiple bid leagues where you have a team make a run in the conference tournament and get a bid that it wouldn't have otherwise gotten, and it looks like we might get one of those in the SEC. Some amazing developments today. Let's check them out. South Carolina and Kentucky pick it up in the second half. Joe Crawford. Hit. Well, Xavier looking to get to the dance. Justin Cage, the three-pointer here for the 10 seed. The Musketeers on top by three at the half. Second half coming up. ESPN's exclusive presentation of Championship Week is brought to you by Budweiser Select. Brewed longer for a bold taste that finishes clean. Expect everything. Back at the U.S. Bank Arena in Cincinnati as Championship Week presented by 7-Up. Rolls to the 8-10 Championship at halftime. Xavier by 3, 26-23. Dave Barnett back to Tim McCormick and Jason Williams. And 
form has again been turned uh, upside down in this game. The last regular season meeting, easy win for St. Joe's at Xavier. The starting guards for St. Joe's outscored their counterparts 36 to 10. First half, Lee and Jallo both scoreless for St. Joe's. Yeah, I think the big issue has been post versus perimeter. St. Joe's has been on the perimeter. They had 39 points last night against Temple. Tonight, six. Other bench, it's been pretty impressive in the paint. And also down low, last game, Duncan, Doman, and Cage all have 45 points, 73 rebounds. So far this game, 20 points, 9 rebounds on the same page. Xavier hot from a three. Four for seven. St. Joe's not two out of nine. And in the semifinal win for the Hawks over uh, Temple, 20 baskets, 13 of them beyond the arc. So as their shooting has betrayed them a little bit, they've had to be a little more resourceful to fight back from what was a 13-point Musketeer lead. Stanley Burrell hemmed in by four white jerseys, open three, Duncan. And he tries to get to the miss in the corner, but can't quite avoid stepping out of bounds. So Xavier at 40% from the field, St. Joe's at 35%. The rebounding is 18-14 for the Musketeers. And again, those two starting guards who had 18 apiece just a week and a half ago at Xavier at the Centos Center, Lee and Jallo, both looking for their first point. Yeah, it's a tough matchup. Cage is a lockdown defender. Jallo can't get to the rim. Lee no longer scoreless with his 46th three-pointer of the year. I got a chance to talk to one assistant coaches for St. Joseph's. They said one guy they never have to worry about is Dwayne Lee. He is the rock for their team. He is there every night, defensively sound, and also offensively always involved. Stanley Burrell without the injured and out for the season, Brian Thornton, Musketeer scoring leader, had just four in the first half. Justin Cage with it. He leads the Musketeers with 10. Now, there is no way, no way at all, that Abdullah Jallo can possibly deal with Justin Cage inside. Take a look at the guard comparison. I would think that Lee and Jallo have an advantage in that department. If they're going to win this game, those numbers need to switch. Jallo just picked up his third foul, however. Stays in the game. Johnny Wolf. Nails the three. His first points. Wolf, the freshman from Cincinnati, Ohio Division I co-player of the year at St. Xavier High School last year. Stakaitis will be on the arc, and Wolf grabs it. Now, one thing to watch for, St. Joe's is switching all their screens. They can get mismatches inside. Cage for Burrell, and it crawls in over Ferguson. Tim, you're exactly right. The last three possessions, they switched down low, and Jowell's end up on Goldman. Great size advantage to take advantage of that down low. Second half starting much the way the first half did. Good seed at St. Joe's. Trying to win its first A-10 tournament since 1997, even though they've taken the last five regular season championships until that string was broken by George Washington this year. Might be a good idea. Once again, get to the lane. You don't need that shot. And Burrell's miss, ending in a foul by Dolman. His first. You know, when you've got the hammer, you use it. They're bigger, they're more athletic. If they miss the shots, they're on the glass. There's Johnny Wolf. If he misses that shot, Dolman and Duncan have inside position against guards. Like we talked about earlier, whenever you get the ball down and low, eventually an outside jump shot is coming around. Free kickouts. We're all trying to guide Stakaitis to Duncan. Wanted no part of it. This time rolling down the lane and draws another Dolman foul. So Justin Dolman, in just a few seconds, picks up his first two. You see for St. Joseph's, they're, they're getting Stakaitis to come around, a lot of curl cuts. He's always in continuous motion. It reminds me a lot of J.J. Redick, how you see him. Always coming off screens, always moving, keeping the defender on their feet. Well, I wonder if J.J. is going to be okay tomorrow with that banged-up knee that he had today. And, and the, the best thing about that last trip for St. Joe's, when you make free throws so well, Gonzaga and the Hawks, the best in America, Phil Martelli wants his guys aggressive to the rim for two reasons. 
not much Xavier shot blocking. Number two, force the action, draw the contact, initiate the bump, get to the rim, get to the free throw line. Well, that's what they did in the, in the second meeting, actually, and got Duncan in the foul trouble. That's why they were able to win the game. And Dolman. First missed free throw for either team. There have been very few free throws to go around. Sakaitis has shot all five for the Hawks. And Duncan, the only two for the Musketeers. Three minutes gone in the second half. Xavier by four. And Dolman drawing Kalathis away from the bucket and then hitting over Ferguson. And that's the problem that St. Joseph's going to have the entire night. You can't switch. If you switch on Dolman or Duncan, they're able to knock down the outside J. I mean, come on. Dolman's shooting floaters? Are you serious? In the pit skeet him. If it's working, it's working. <laughs> Make it do what it do, baby. Might be a good idea to try to get Ferguson to touch inside. He's calling for it. They need some post action. Shot clock winding down for Lee, who is going to be bailed out by the foul call. Well, this is what we were talking about right here on the screen and roll. You just saw Burrell with a great pass. Domo just a little head back, and you got to respect it. I mean, guys, he, he can shoot the ball like crazy from the outside. Great little teardrop in the lane. Foul called on Johnny Wolf, his first. All right. This is a major injustice, and somebody's going to have to explain to me why last year Lee was on first team all A-10 defense. He's upgraded his effort on the defensive end, and this year he gets shut out. How can that be as good as he is on the ball defensively? No way. I, I think he got cheated this year, and especially knowing his whole story. He's one of the most hardworking young men I've ever met, and you only want successful things happen for me. I mean, he's, he's a pit bull, like you said, on the ball. He's on the J. Will all defense. Team. He's on my all-defensive team. He gets an A-plus, baby. They have something to do with uh, going from regular season champs to fifth seed. Not that it makes it fair. You might explain it. Brandon Cole comes in off the bench. And the junior from Richmond Park, Illinois, has four. Xavier by six. There's a look at Tim McCormick move. Look at the patience. The mobility in the lane. Yeah, the difference is he used his left. I could. Mallon along the baseline. St. Joe starts the second half cold. They trail by as many as 13 in the first. Mismatch problem right here. Got to get the ball back to Burrell. He has a mismatch. Started by the 6'10", Kalapis. Cole backing down Mallon. And Mallon will be called. His second. Xavier regaining some control of this A-10 championship. Does Jerry McNamara have yet more magic up his sleeve? The Orange tries to cap off its remarkable Big East tourney run. Their battle with Pitt will tip off at 8.15 p.m. Eastern time. Xavier 35-29, the Musketeers trying to become the first team ever to win uh, four games in four days, two different years to win a conference tournament. One of ten in the country to do it even once. Dolman's inbound pass stolen by Jallo. Rejection Ooh. by Burrell, but he was fouled. Abdullah Jallo, St. Joe's leading scorer, nearly 15 per game, still scoreless tonight. Here is that limited group, teams that have won their conference tournament, having to play four in four days. Xavier did it two years ago. Iowa, in a memorable fashion, Tim, uh, 2001, very disappointing regular season. Then Steve Alford recharged that group real quickly. Arkansas, St. Louis, Charlotte, UNLV, Marquette, Auburn, and uh, the very first team. As you remember, back in 1939, Clemson in the Southern Cup. I don't actually remember that, but Xavier led by Lionel, Lionel Chalmers and Thad Mata. Jason, you, you think that, that, that Abdullah Jalla has had some growth, but what advice would you give him at this point for a young player that's trying to develop? Well, he reminds me a lot of myself, and one person I'm working with now is John Lucas, and John always tells me I'm thinking too much. I'm always thinking on the court. Ooh. Hard call right there. Jallo with his fourth. After he finally gets his first two points of the night. Is this what you're talking about? About thinking, how can that be a foul? Nope, they're going to put it on Dolan, his third. Justin.
Brandon Dolman picks it up. There we go. Well, John Lucas always tells you, I'm thinking too much. I think that's the one issue for Jalo. You can't overanalyze everything. You just got to go out there and play and let your emotions take over. Wolf denying lead the three-pointer. Ferguson again shooting well when he takes the shots, which they don't think is quite often enough. Jallo off the jump stop, another Xavier foul, and this will make six already in the second half against the Musketeers. And that's the way he needs to play. He needs to get to the basket, create contact, go to the free throw line. His penetration is what he's been doing great in the past three games. He's been going to the free throw line seven times a game. He shot over 23 free throws the last three games, so he's really trying to get himself going. I think it's important to focus on his improvement. Last year, averaging four points per game, up to almost 15. And he's definitely a worker. Sean Miller fears Jalo more than anybody else. And his coach, Phil Martelli, actually had to shut down his extra work two weeks ago. He said that he was spending too much time on his own, working on his game, and felt that it may have been hurting his legs. Oh, I love that. I love that's dedication to the game. That's about love. Jallo, four for four at the line. St. Joe's, best free throw shooting team in the country. Ten for 11 as they come back with him, too. Uh, now it's four on Jallo. And of all places, Jason, to pick up your fourth foul. Well, I don't think that's a foul. I think it's just defensive intensity. And that's how you get yourself going in the game. I think it's a bad call. It was a push-off on Wolf. I love the way he was hunting the ball. That's how you have to play defense. See, there's no hands. A little push-off right there. You got to let him play physical. It's a tournament, baby. So Jallo. Oh, good long while is going to be sitting now. Almost a carry violation. And in and out, back in the three by Wolf. That's what happens when you let a freshman get some confidence. Hey, there's no freshman this time of year. Technical foul called on Phil Martelli. You know, I agree with Phil Martelli. And I like the fact that he's standing up for his player. That was a questionable call on the perimeter. I thought it should have gone the other way with a little elbow. A little push off on the penetration. Officially, it goes on the Hawks bench. And Josh Duncan, the 88% free throw shooter. Tops for the Musketeers. Jinx. Seven points all in the first half. Off a career high 20 points. All right, Jason, tell us what Phil Martelli's so mad about. Well, it's right here. You see the little push-off right there with the elbow. I mean, Jallo's just hawking the ball. I mean, that, that wasn't a foul at all. I would be just as mad as Martelli was, too. Yeah, I, I tell you this. That's just a let him play. Let, don't call that. It should go either way. It's tournament. It's March. Come on, guys. And they have been letting him play all night. Yep. So it was the call's out of character. Now, it's, it's difficult. It, it's difficult, Dave, because the players get into a flow. They, they know what the referees are letting go. And look at the second half start by St. Joe's. Here's a little zone defense. First time we've seen it in the second half. Nice adjustment by Sean Miller. Well, St. Joe's eyes should be lined up right now. Penetration and kick. The Kytus hits on the pull-up along the baseline. He's got 13. I mean, that's how these guys dismantled Temple. They went in the zone, and Sakaitis and Jalo just went crazy. 39 points from three versus Temple. Turnover, offensive foul. Oh, you think that's a makeup call, guys? Justin Cage. Well, not that much of a makeup. It's his first. <laughs> Jalo just got his fourth. Yeah, but I like the intelligence. Look, if there's a questionable call, especially after a technical, you go inside, you try to drop because the payback is probably coming. The sixth offensive foul call against Musketeers. Galefis, whose offense off the bench, was so key in the comeback in the first half. Ferguson misses the follow. Xavier Ball. Tim, I have a question. How come St. Joseph doesn't get Dwayne Lee the ball more against Wolf? You would think that he had the advantage of being a veteran, be able to take advantage of the opportunity against Wolf, a freshman. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jason. And if you look at the five players on the court for each team, if St. Joe's has a mismatch in their favor, it would be Lee against Wolf. Well, on paper, that is a huge mismatch. Hasn't been so far tonight. <laughs> Burrell, all 
all the way through. And Lee saves it and then throws it away. Dolman at big fourth. Burrell for Cage. And they'll be forced to put it back outside. I have no idea why Xavier does not try to post up Duncan or Dolman. There's Dolman right there. They can't cover him in the paint. Walk. Got a walk. Maybe that's why. Turnovers continue to mount. That's 12 on a team that averages 13 per game, Xavier. Well, Sakaitis is doing a great job of pushing Dolman off the block, really not allowing him to post up to be a low threat down low. St. Joe's at 18 and 12, even if they lose, would be a uh, dead block certainty to make it back to the NIT that made the finals last year. Not the goal, obviously, as Stachitis is fouled. Burrell will pick up his third. And guys, looking at St. Joseph's, I've seen a couple guys bending over, breathing kind of heavy. Four games and four nights can do it to you, but it looks like Xavier has a little bit more pep in their step. That might have something to do with their deeper bench. Stanley Burrell with his third. Get a little reminder about being smart. Remember, Ahmad Nivens, the big guy. St. Anthony's High School. He sprained his ankle. He's not available. They were very thin before his injury. And I got to give Dwayne Lee my Soul Warrior Award. This guy plays 39.4 minutes a game, which is amazing. Best in the country, staying as close as they are because mainly Stachitis continues to knock down the free throws six out of seven how long do you think he'll be out Dave not very long because remember even with Nivens St. Joe's was playing a seven-man rotation Alvin Mofanania got off the bench for two minutes in the first half that's the only change in what's been a six-man rotation tonight for the Hawks and even minus two senior starters, Xavier, a lot deeper team tonight as Dolman's miss comes off to Dwayne Lee. How about the box out by Fergie down low? Way to put a body on him. Hawks can shoot to tie or Lee. They're only 3 of 11 from 3 tonight. After making 13 beyond the arc out of the total of 20 baskets in the semifinals against Temple yesterday. And Dwayne Lee needs to get the ball. He's going to be the only player to be able to create something for the St. Joseph's team. Edwin Lashley just in and misses a three. Freshman from Salisbury, Maryland. Yeah, a bit quick, I think. Don't like the shot, especially for a freshman just injuring the game. Give the ball to your senior veteran. So Lashley, Kalafis, and a little bit of Mo Fadanya. Some total of the St. Joe's bench tonight. Tim, it seems like Doman doesn't know what to do with the ball on the block. Justin Cage backs out, throws inside for Duncan. He does. He does. Give me the ball, baby. Yeah. And he's a binge scorer. When he gets rolling, as he did last night in the semis, look out. He's got the crowd back into it. Whistled before the drive by Lee. And with 11-13 remaining, the 10 championship. Abdullah Jallo picking up a controversial fourth foul, setting off some emotion on the Hawks bench. They trail by four. ESPN's exclusive presentation of Championship Week is presented by 7-Up. If you want 100% natural lemon and lime flavors, the only way to go is up. And in part by Dodge. You can take life as it comes, or you can grab life by the horns. Dodge. U.S. Bank Arena on the banks of the Ohio River in Cincinnati. A-10 championship. Part of championship week presented by 7-Up. The Musketeers by four. Six of ten this half. Both has they have started shooting tremendously well. This is a, roughly the part of the game in the first half where they went stone cold. About six and a half scoreless minutes. And a 13-point lead completely disappeared. Wayne Lee has all six of his points here in the second half. You know, Tim, it looks like Xavier is playing with a pep in her step. What, what are the kind of things do you think Sean Miller has told them in order to motivate them in the last couple of days? <laughs> I was actually laughing because we had them at the Cintas Center 11 days ago, and I was pretty critical of how lethargic and passive Xavier was during our broadcast. The next day at practice, Sean Miller played a tape 
of my comments on how I thought they didn't bring the effort. That might have been their key. Dolman travels. 13th turnover by Xavier. Did you talk to Sean Miller about it yet? <laughs> he said it was all good. <laughs> well, if you, get, if you get beat at home on senior night and, and you don't bring effort, th th there's an issue there. But they've responded so incredibly well. Coaches ought to use every tool at their disposal, <laughs> even if it includes Tim McCormick. <laughs> St. Joe's again in position to tie. Down as many as 13 in the first half. Rob Ferguson Ooh, counted in one. Now, Rob Ferguson is very much an underutilized resource. Big part of it is that he doesn't demand position all the time. I think his perimeter guys ignore him. That's a post player that needs a touch probably two of every four possessions. Well, I think that all comes with maturity. You see sometimes he has post position, but he doesn't demand the ball. It reminds me a lot of Curtis Withers. Sometimes Curtis Withers for Charlotte has position, but doesn't demand the ball. That's see, what they need to do. 42-41 St. Joseph's on the three-point play by Ferguson. Duncan called for his second foul. When Jallo picked up that fourth foul when the bench for St. Joe's was hit with the Tech, they were down five. So maybe that little burst of emotion is behind the run from five down to one up. First lead for them since five to four. Duncan shot short, rebounded by Lee, and a one-man fast break. Yeah, if you don't go to Ferguson and get him at least a touch, I think you're making a huge mistake. I think they're calling the same set to get Fergie on the block. Yep, here comes that slip screen right here. And Lee guarded by B.J. Raymond, who has four fouls. At the 10-minute mark, halfway through the second half. Yeah, they're, they're passing the ball before he can even post up. Give him a chance to get down there and grab that position. Six to shoot. Ferguson for Kalafis. And it is left to him to make it up by himself. And he barely got it up in time, and he nails it. First point to the half, 10 for the game off the bench for Kalafis. And I'm sweating bullets over here. I don't understand how St. Joseph doesn't get the ball to leave when the shot clock's doing him down. Timeout, Sean Miller, 9.34 to go, and St. Joe's has its largest lead. Carl Krauser in Pittsburgh trying to end Syracuse's amazing run. The Big East Championship game tips off at 8.15 Eastern. Xavier finds himself down three. Sean Miller, the former Pitt point guard, four-year starter, the career leader in assists and free throw percentage out of Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. Finds himself locked up with the uh, much more experienced Phil Martelli. Yeah. Miller in his second year, Martelli his 11th. I think that Sean Miller is one of the fast-rising young coaches in the game, but in this situation, you have to like Phil Martelli coaching your team. Burrell draws the foul by Lee, his second in the team sixth. And this is what you're going to see right here. This is the post presence of Ferguson down low. Just enough to get it over the top. If I was St. Joseph's, we saw what we were talking about, Tim. I would keep running that slip screen for him and keep giving him the ball on the low post block. Yeah, and if you look around the A-10, Xavier is a team that you can hurt in the low post. Since Brian Thornton went out with a broken ankle, they don't have much resistance defensively in the paint. Quiet second half for Cage, who had 10 to leak in the first half, and his first two since intermission as Brian Thornton approves. Cage giving the Musketeers a chance to tie. Well, I tell you right there what the difference, difference maker right there for that shot was. He dipped his see Brian Thornton. Cage dips his shoulder, and once he dips that shoulder and gets that left shoulder past you, with his body size, there's no way to stop him. Yeah, Justin Cage told me that they certainly miss Brian Thornton, but he can't argue with the fact that since Thornton's been out, there's no post guy parking up the middle. It's much easier for him to get to the rim. Thornton, by the way, just named as Xavier's first ever academic All-America. Definitely worth congratulations. Working on his NBA with a 3-3 GPA. Ferguson knocked out of bounds by Cage. You know what? I had Thornton on my first team all 8-10, Tim. I had him on there. First team, baby. He's good. He missed a lot of games, though, Jason. If he doesn't get injured, he may be player of the year in the eighth inning, not just first right. team. 
Xavier without its fifth-year senior leader, without senior guard Diedrich Finn, thrown off the team about three weeks ago, locked up 44-44. Mallon trying to go over the back here. I love, absolutely love that set play, though. Ferguson is a player that they don't have an answer for defensively. It didn't work out, but they will have a chance to win the game if they force feed the ball into the post. Third foul on Mallon. Eighth against the team. And here's Brandon Cole, who has only tried nine free throws all year, but he's made eight. Contributor to the Elite Eight Musketeer team from a couple of years ago. St. Joe's that year, 2004, stopped by Oklahoma State. Two points away from the Final Four. Stachitis doesn't get the roll, but it's knocked out to Ferguson. Stachitis uh -oh. pulls the trigger. All three. 18 for Stachitis. He had 18 in the semis. How about the guts of that kid to shoot the ball the first time and then it again on the second? Stolen by Lee. Oh. St. Joe's in transition. Kalathis fouled as he goes up between Raymond and Dolman. And that's why Lee should have been back on first team all defensive 18 to Plays like that. Now, Chet Stachitis, a dependable shooter. You may remember back against Kansas, he had 27. And how do you like the delivery off the offensive glass by Rob Ferguson? Foul was called on Cage, his second. Kalafis, who was a 5'11 point guard as a high school freshman. A 6'10 big man as a senior. All state from Castleberry, Florida. Do you believe that he benefited from being a point guard when he entered high school and a center when he left? He never lost his ball handling ability. A little bit like Mike Dunleavy. Biggest lead of the game for St. Joe's. 21 of their 49 points off turnovers. And a chance for more here. Foul on Dolman, his fourth. And this is going to be the crucial time of the game. You see Johnny Wolf, a freshman point guard, going against a senior point guard. And Dwayne Lee could be the big difference maker for tonight's game. The pressure defense gets a little bit to him. Just loses his feet. Got to take care of the ball. Hey, there is no secret in the A-10 in March. And I'll tell you one thing that people say about Xavier. They get stagnant at times. They rely on one-on-one. -on -one. That's what we're seeing right now. Alathis really has upgraded his ability, much more featured than what we saw at St. Joe's earlier. St. Joe's all years traded the uh, National League free throw percentage with Gonzaga. They ended this tournament number one, and Kalafis is four for four. 7-0 run St. Joe's. Eight-minute mark of the A-10 championship. Hawks down 13 midway through the first half. Down three at the half. But they have taken control here midway in the second half. Will Caudle misses on the hook. And Stachitis is wrestled down by Josh Duncan, who picks up his third. All right, here's the deal. Xavier's a killer off the dribble. St. Joe's just won't let him. Chet Stachitis, the senior, for the second straight game, 18 points. This run, remember, started after the technical following Jallo's fourth foul. Seven forty to play in the A-10 championship from Cincinnati. Part of championship week presented by 7-Up. And St. Joe's has taken control here, 51-44. to If you want to look at a reason, statistically, it's very easy to find. They have forced 15 Xavier turnovers, committed only six. And look at the points off the turnovers, 23-2. They're making Xavier self-destruct. Well, you know the thing I like about St. Joe's is they don't have anybody who's athletically kind of, kind of a freak on the court. They rely upon each and every single possession for each other to get baskets. Where you have Xavier who has put guys like Burrell, a pro maybe in Duncan, who maybe sometimes might try to do it by themselves. Yeah, I'll take it one step further. If you look at the Atlantic 10, there are seven, maybe eight rosters that I would trade for St. Joe's. I don't think
think that they have tremendous physical ability, but they have adapted a system that fits their personnel. I give Phil Martelli a ton of credit for what this team has become. Dakota's making a bid for tournament uh, MVP, averaging 15.7, shooting 56% beyond the arc in the first three games, and he has 20, eight of nine from the free throw line here. Biggest lead, 9-0 run. And the St. Joe's foul will be their ninth. Now, guys, I, I disagree with this call sometimes. I feel like players who initiate the contact don't get called for the foul. You're going to see on the drive that Cage initiates the contact. But, it, Tim, what do you think about that call that sometimes refs make? Uh, they're protecting the offensive player. Aggressiveness gets rewarded. And as you see that score, 53-44. Remember, Phil Martelli's magic number for victory is 65 points. Cage hits the first of the one and one. Well, this amazing Big East uh, season and tournament comes to a close tonight. Syracuse Pittsburgh for the Big East Championship presented by Aero Pro Salt, part of Championship Week presented by 7-Up. That follows us here on ESPN from Madison Square Garden. And for as much as GMAC has been scrutinized, I love the way he's really playing in people's faces. The Big East Championship scheduled to uh, tip off at 8.15 Eastern Time from New York City. A one, three, one. Bergie. Asking again why he doesn't shoot more often. 56-46 St. Joe's. 11 for Ferguson. Including two from three. Seven minutes to go in the A-10 championship. Burrell for three. Gets the answer. <laughs> Heavy, heavyweight blow after heavyweight blow. Back and forth. I, I like the senior point guard right here. Dolman playing with four fouls out on Kalafis. How about Dwayne Lee and Fergie in the screen and roll? Mo Fanani has come in from Allen who picked up his fourth just a moment ago. Ten on the shot clock. Stakaitis driving on Cage. The pull-up, he hit from the same spot a moment ago. This time draws the foul. And Cage is uh, pretty close to being in trouble himself. That's his third. Stanley Burrell is making the transition from premier scorer to point guard, taking over for Diedrich Finn. A future all A-10 performer if he gets comfortable. Remember, next year, Drew Labner takes over point, allows him to move to his natural position of shooting guard. Nine of ten at the line now for Stakaitis. 21 points. I, I keep wondering how Stakaitis gets his shot off Cage. You think Cage being around 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, you see the, the way he's been shooting the ball as of late. I don't know how he gets his shot off the, the taller cage, but he's finding a way to get it done. Well, even with that miss, that is not the guy you want on the line down the stretch for St. Joe's. Fans wanted a Mofanania foul. As Duncan finally took it away. Well, Duncan, a bit quiet so far. He was big yesterday. You wonder if the legs are fatigued. Yeah, career high 20 yesterday, 10 today. Nice reverse, Justin Cage, 17 to lead the Musketeers. Six out of seven for Cage. Xavier back within six, timeout St. Joe's. Now, both teams are playing their fourth in four nights. Is it all adrenaline at this point? Do you totally forget about fatigue, or can you not possibly get it out of your mind? It's, it's a championship game. I, I don't think about fatigue. And anybody who talks about it around me, it's not an issue. This is all about heart and desire. Who's going to be willing to give the most on the court tonight? I also think that it's important as you look at the profile of Xavier. 17 and 10. They were definitely on a roll trying to get that NCAA bid until Brian Thornton went down with that broken ankle. And what's important about that, after that game against LaSalle on February 11th, Sean Miller and his staff sat in a meeting room from 4 o'clock in the afternoon until 11 at night, and they developed a completely new offense that was focused on their perimeter. The next day, they went into training camp mode 
That offense looks pretty good, Dave. It's going to be like uh, finishing your uh, master's thesis, getting down to the last page, and then tearing it up and starting all over again. But they have done it. So far, the grade is A, but they're in trouble. Down 6 5 50 to play. Jallo back in, sitting a long time after he picked up his fourth foul. A bench technical against St. Joe's, but they have been ignited since that point, and they've taken control of the game. Shot clock. Ferguson and Akalafis with six to shoot. Takes Dolman in. Dolman got a hand on it. And the battle for the board is going to be deflected out to Jallo. Good decision. I want to point out once again that Phil Martelli has not had his team practice or shoot around since they've been here. Last year he felt they were tired. They look fresh. Just hotel walkthroughs so they can have some energy from this point of the final on. Traveling, they turn it over. Just their seventh. And they force 15. Good mistake right there by Ferguson. Xavier doing a good job of getting him out of his comfort zone, making him put the ball on the ground. First turnover this half for the Hawks. I don't see any evidence whatsoever that they're tired. No. They're here, tired. It should be deeper. A little different story, perhaps. Under five minutes. St. Joe's doing a terrific Ooh. job as well, keeping the crowd out of it. And Wolf had his heel hit the midcourt stripe over and back. There's 60 turnover. That freshman point guard, watch his left foot. Takes the step back, a little ball pressure. Ooh, I don't know about that. Yeah. I think the back right got it. I think the right heel just grazed it. After it looked like he would, I think he did then. This is a little fresh mistakes, not used to being in an environment like this. Number 23-2, St. Joe's points off turnovers, and Stachitis is fouled by Cage, who picks up his fourth, trying the three-pointer. So Cage with four, Dolman with four, B.J. Raymond with four for the Musketeers. Well, that's about the third or fourth time that Cage has tried to slip through a screen instead of following his man. You got to learn when you're playing against shooters, you got to trail them, you got to always chase them. You can't try to cut corners and cheat it. Second time tonight, Stachitis fouled on a three-point try. Made all three in the first half. And Phil Martelli said the biggest difference between this team has been the play of the seniors. Stachitis and Lee are quiet. They're not very verbal, but they're, they're on the court. Lead by example attitude has been the fuel for this comeback. And Martelli pointed to guys like Tyrone Farley, Jameer Nelson, Delonte West, Dwayne Jones. All of the seniors that have played in such big games laid a foundation for this Hawk team. Stachitis inheriting the refusal to lose attitude from the team two years ago, led by Jameer Nelson and Delonte West within two points of the final four. Doing it without freshman center Ahmad Nivens tonight. 23 points for Stachitis. 10 better than his average, and they lead by eight. That gets to the game. Look at the difference on the bench. All St. Joseph's players are standing up, slapping the ground. Three-pointer for Rell. Biggest shot of the night for Xavier. It's March. It's March, Tim. <laughs> it's March. Uh, watch Stachitis. They're trying to get him touches. He's drawing fouls. He's very active. Both these players, four fouls, Jallo and Raymond. Stachitis back to Jallo. And he runs oh. right into Duncan. Offensive foul and a do -like Jallo. St. Joe's leading score and rebounder fouls out at the four-minute mark. And it was a questionable call. He was standing underneath the basket. Maybe time for a little mid-range there. Duncan a bit late, but you can't argue with the chest-to-chest -chest bump. It, it, you got to know right now, especially as a guard in this situation, somebody's going to try to flop him, especially when you have four fouls. You got to be very tight with the ball and come to a jump stop two feet. Four points, four boards for Jallo, the sophomore from District Hills, Maryland, who averages 14.9. Now, if the same thing happens after he picks up his fourth foul, St. Joe's is going to win this thing by 15 points. This is the time right here when it's time to tighten it up on the defense then. If you win the game, Jason, it's because you make stop. Don't focus on the offense. 
Exactly right, Tim. Defense wins games. Defense wins games. Burrell. He wants the ball. He wants it. Yeah, but look at 6 10 Calafis to shoot over. Another three on the way. And finds the bottom. Three straight threes for Burrell. It's a two point game. Oh, yeah. And you couldn't hear a jet plane take off at the U.S. Bank Arena at the moment. Lead for Kalefis, five to shoot, all the way through and blows the layup. So an 11-3 Xavier run. And they're in position at 249 to tie or lead. But then they go back to Burrell right here. They go right back to him. Isolation, baby. He's feeling it. Going for four straight threes, and this one's just short. Yeah, another long possession offensively. That's the maturity of St. Joe's. Xavier on offense right now, very much perimeter oriented. But who can make a stop? Cage with four fouls, chasing Stachitis. Dolman with four fouls, has Ferguson. And Stachitis cut off by Duncan. Shot clock under 10. Lee resets with five to shoot. Oh, and fumbles it away into the hands of Raymond at the two-minute mark, a two-point game. Timeout, Sean Miller. I'm loving this matchup. They can't get to the rim. Beautiful release. And that's so strong because when you've got tired legs, remember four games, four days. You know what I like right now? It's a decision. St. Joe's is playing this Tupperware defense. It's airtight in the lane. And so Xavier's going to have to make jump shots if they're going to pull this out. I mean, did you see that heart? Did you see the passion in his face? I mean, this guy, he wants, look at his eyes right now. That's the eyes of a winner, eyes of a tiger. He wants the ball every single possession. Remember last year, as a freshman, if he didn't get shots, it would affect his defense, every part of his game. The maturity is coming. Told me that he's a big fan of Ray Allen. He does the homework. He studies Ray Allen's game. Yes. Making jump shots like that, you see it. So Xavier down to his last timeout. St. Joe's has two, both in the double bonus. Hawks have the possession arrow. Despite being outshot tonight, 50% to 36%, St. Joe's leads 59-57. Because they keep doing what they've done all year at the free throw line, where they're the best in the country. Inside, crowded, but Cage gets it off the glass. I can barely hear myself think, guys. Mellon fouls out. 145 remaining. Justin Cage, when we come back, will be shooting for the three-point play to give Xavier the lead in the A-10 championship in Cincinnati. Reese Davis with you in the studio. He has been the leading man not far from Broadway all week in the Big East tournament. Jerry McNamara leading Syracuse against Pitt. Tip 15 minutes after the hour, guys. And Justin Cage misses the free throw, but it's grabbed by Brandon Cole and Xavier off the biggest rebound of the night with a fresh shot clock in a minute, 36 to go. Tied at 59. Justin Cage with a career-high 19. Just missed the chance for the lead, but Xavier may make it work anyway. Our sixth tie, they were down 10. The Musketeers were with 7.08 remaining. 13-3 run in progress. Eight to shoot for Burrell. 
It was keyed this run. Drives past Ferguson and hit the bottom of the rim. Rebounded by Stakaitis. St. Joe's down 13 in the first half. Dave, we saw both these teams in January. How improbable is it that one of them will play in the NCAA from what we saw earlier? Totally improbable, but it will be well deserved. Whoever comes out of this thing, winning four in four days, will have earned their trip to the dance. Timeout. 57 seconds. Uh, to put it in perspective, Xavier lost their big man. They've adjusted. They went from post-oriented to perimeter-oriented. And St. Joe's, Phil Martelli said his team was wildly inconsistent. He's relied heavily on his seniors. Mallon, Lee, Stachitis. Uh, I, I'm amazed. I would have never believed these teams could be here. Xavier 12-2 and two at one time. One went down. They came into this tournament losers of eight of their last 13, but they win three straight to get here. They're 20 and 10. St. Joe's 10 and 12 at one point. They've won eight straight coming in, and you can't get more even than that. No, guys, I don't care what anybody says. This has nothing to do with physical capacity right now. It's about indomitable will. Who wants it more? Jason, you're a point guard here. You've got the ball. Tell me what you're going through. I got to give the ball to Fergie down low or get Sakaias to come up a screen. One of the two options. They've been working all night long. Stakaitis. Now Ferguson. Remember Dillman guarding him. That's four fouls. Mallon just fouled out. Scoreless for St. Joe. Six to shoot. Lee. Partially blocked by Cole. It comes down to Raymond and a foul with 38.2 seconds. Yeah, that's the dilemma. You want to run clock, but you still want the challenge of getting a good look. Watch the closure defensively. Big time defensive play. My goodness. Well, I think that's been a problem for St. Joe's the entire night. When it comes, shot clock comes down, they don't have the ball in the hands of the right person at the right time. 8.15, tip off time for the Big East. Syracuse and Pittsburgh. Third foul on Lee. The reason St. Joe's is in this game, they have outscored the Musketeers at the line 24 to 6. And B.J. Raymond, just a 65% free throw shooter, scoreless tonight. One more chance to break this time. The way they have overcome 35% shooting is 89% shooting for the best free throw shooting team in the country. Raymond gets the second in. And his first point. But Xavier up one with 36 seconds of the A-10 final. Time for champions. Stakaitis oh. is stripped by Cage. It comes off to Ferguson with 24 to shoot, 26 to play. Well, they may want to talk it over. Last time out called and uh, at a good point because Burrell and Lee looked like they wanted to get into it. So Phil Martelli calls his final timeout with 25.3, down one. Tim, what do you think they do? Do you think they go to Fergie down low, or do you think they go to Sakaitis on the side? I think you look for misdirection. You know that Sean Miller is going to talk about the high pick and roll with Lee and Ferguson. That's what they've run all year at crunch time. Remember when we had the game St. Jones against Charlotte? They went down to that last play where they got Ferguson a wide open three. That's what I think. All so maybe to the to the post with Ferguson, but he's got to be the guy. You're looking for the Big East Championship presented by Errol Fasol. It follows uh, immediately. Scheduled for an 8:15 tip-off from Madison Square Garden. As Syracuse tries to finish off uh, their amazing run, they take on 16 Frank Pittsburgh in the final. Last night, Pittsburgh won without Gray or Krauser getting it done. I think tonight the Qs goes down. I think they hold up. I think Jim Behan has something to prove. I think G-Mac has something to prove the entire tournament. And Phil Martelli said that our best offensive sequences are off the dribble when we're not going to score, but we're going to create for our teammates. The last three trips, you had Lee get a shot blocked. You had Kalaitis get a block. Jalo fouled out of the game on a similar play. They need to drive and kick, and maybe Stakaitis, who has been quiet, is a good option spotting up. Dakaitis' last field goal was eight and a half minutes to play. Since then, five free throws. Tim, you know what I do? I go in the basket and I head fake. The last three shots have got him blocked. They want a block shot. Dakaitis will inbound. Look for him to get it back. He's got 23 points. Lee with 23 seconds, 20 on the shot clock. There's Dakaitis. Cut off 
on the baseline by Cage. He almost fumbled it into his own bench. To Ferguson, open and good. Jones with 13 seconds. Burrell into a double team. And the final Xavier timeout with 7.3 seconds to play. The man, we've been wondering why he hasn't taken more shots all night, <laughs> takes the shot, Rob Ferguson. And the maturity of Stachitis, not known as a pure handle. This is the kind of hustle plays, the 50-50 balls that you come up with. And check out the bench, the reaction time. They're feeling NCAA right now. Now let's talk a little bit about the challenge for Sean Miller. Stanley Burrell is the playmaker. Give him the ball, spread the court, let him create. He either gets a good one-on-one -on -one opportunity. If the defense commits, he's surrounded by jump shooters. St. Joe's trying to do what their last five teams, all A-10 regular season champions, never managed. And that was to follow it up with an A-10 tournament championship. They haven't won this thing in nine years. Xavier trying to win their third in the last five years. Only one bid to the NCAA tournament up for this game. A-10 will get two in the tournament by virtue of George Washington's quarterfinal loss to Temple. And it's funny, guys, how your season comes down to one stop or one made shot to be the difference maker. And Dave, what I'm thinking right now is Burrell to the rim. Keep an eye on Duncan. He's been quiet, but he's a tall jump shooter. Take a little screen and roll, Tim. No timeouts. Both teams double bonus. 7.3 seconds. And Burrell set to inbound it. He leads the backcourt with 15 points tonight. Cage has 19. He comes close, but it's in to Dolman. Dolman all the way to the hoop. Whistle with 5.1 seconds. Ferguson came over. Stachitis came over, and Stachitis is called for the foul. His first of the game. A strong decision. The lane parted like the Red Sea. Dolman got bailed out on this play. Is there contact? There was a reach yep. by Stachitis. Yep, it was from the weak side. I think it's a smart play, guys. Rather send him to the line to shoot two than give him an easy deuce. First trip to the line to die for Dolman. 77% for the year. Xavier has been outscored to the free throw line 24 to 7. They're 7 for 11. Justin Dolman, Jr. from Union, Kentucky. With 5.1 seconds, and the only thing riding on these shots is the A-10 championship. <laughs> Sean Miller reminding his players they have no timeouts left. 15 minutes from the Xavier campus. Dolman for the lead. 62-61, no timeouts for St. Joe's. Xavier, the 10th seed, can be the lowest ever to win this tournament. Inbounds, here's Lee with four seconds. Lee all the way through, blocks! And they may put some time back on the clock. This game is not over. There was a fraction of the second still on the clock when the ball went out of bounds. Dave, from my perspective, five-tenths of a second will be remaining. Enough time for a catch and shot. So Frank Scagliata, Joe DeMeo, and Ray Perrone will come over and take a look how about how much time should be there. Dolman the block. It goes out at one, well, maybe nine-tenths of a second. And plenty of time. Phil Martelli gets an opportunity. This is a benefit for St. Joe's. Why? As they review, they go ahead and have a chance to diagram a play. This is a free timeout for Phil Martelli. 1.3 seconds, they decide. For St. Joe's to try to win the A-10 championship. It's got to be Stachitis or Ferguson. Stachitis because he's the best jump shooter. Ferguson because he's tall enough that he can shoot over the top of the defense. Stachitis has 23. Ferguson has 13. And 
and the 6'10", Pat Kalafis to inbound along the baseline. Xavier's going to switch everything. Kalafis for Lee. Three-pointer blocked by Cage, and Xavier has won the A-10 Tournament Championship. Musketeers. For Jason Williams, Tim McCormick, Dave Barnett.